Hello, it's February 2020 and I'm trying to learn game development right now and I have uh, a website that I'll put into the description of this video which is covering some of the tutorials and books and uh, websites that I'm exploring to learn game development. Um, specifically, I'm, I'm focusing on C++ and Unreal Engine. Um, a little bit of Houdini as well. And in this video, I'm just going to go over uh, one of the Unreal Engine tutorials that I did recently just to capture some of my learning and sort of explain uh, how Unreal operates. And so on the, uh, the official Unreal uh, learning website, the first tutorial that I went through was just this one here, a very short one. It's called Your First Hour with Unreal Engine. It just gets you used to the user interface, um, how to build up a simple, level, a simple level, how to sort of drag assets and sort of compose them together into something that you can explore and play with. And uh, yeah, if you're thinking of getting into some Unreal Engine, it's a really good place to start. Uh, the next one, that, the one that I'm going to focus on today was this one here, the Twin Stick Shooter with Blueprint, where you make sort of a, an arena style shooter uh, where you can control a character with a gamepad. I've got a Xbox controller connected to the machine right now, and so we're gonna we're gonna look at that. I'm gonna fire up uh, Unreal Engine right now. We're gonna take out uh, or take a look at my version of this game, and I'm gonna show you, you know, some of the the assets that went into it. Some of the coding went into it. Um, some of it is C++. Most of it is Blueprint, which is a visual programming language that's built into Unreal. And then I will talk about just some of maybe the, um, the issues I ran into with this tutorial, some of the additions I made after the tutorial, and some of the other things I explored around version control and whatnot, uh, sort of tangential to uh, the actual coding of this game. All right, so this right here is, is Unreal Engine. And we've booted up into this game, and I can look around into this viewport. This is the level that I built up. Just a very, very simple level. I sort of drag some sort of square objects in here and then put some textures on them to, uh, to produce some walls and a floor. Uh, you can sort of see a area up here which is, um, it looks like a, a large sort of invisible rectangle. This is where enemies are gonna sort of spawn out of the air, drop down into this playing area and uh, combat with my character, my hero character. The hero character has a gun and he's gonna be shooting projectiles, laser projectiles from that gun. And the enemies are gonna be doing damage just if they come close enough to me uh, to hurt me. And so there are some uh, assets that we started with in this game that were provided uh, with the tutorial. And uh, yeah, first I think I'll just demonstrate the, the game in action. I'm not sure you're going to be able to hear the sounds of this game because they're just going to be playing out of my PC uh, speaker here, but they, they might be picked up by the microphone. We'll see. So here I am. Grab my controller. You can see the, the bad guys are sort of spawning from the sky. I'm able to, with the left stick of the controller, walk around them. And then with the right stick, when I engage it, I'm going to be able to change the direction that I'm facing and it will also start firing. And if I just uh, stop moving, I get injured and I fall over, I'm dead. And then I'll respawn. The whole thing happens again. You can see a health bar up at the top. You can see a score. Okay. Stop playing there. So where to begin? Unreal Engine, uh, it feels a little daunting. Uh, it's, you know, this is a... It's a professional game creation engine. Uh, there's lots of capabilities here. Uh, it's actually free, so you can you can download engine, uh, Unreal Engine today for free and do all the things that you, you're going to see me do here. I'm going to start in the settings and just quickly show the project settings. And what I want to focus on here is uh, input. So I'm going to go to input section here. 
In a little bit, I'm going to be taking you into the code, and I'm going to show you what's called Blueprint. That's the visual programming language. And in Blueprint, we're going to uh, be able to connect to uh, the two sticks uh, on the game controller to move the character and aim the character's gun. And we've also mapped those not only to the controller, but also to the keyboard. And that way you don't have to independently reference the keyboard and the controller in the Blueprint code. You can reference, in this case, if you look up here, I've got the gamepad uh, left thumbstick mapped to something called Move Up. And I've also mapped uh, W and S to it. So with the thumbstick, it's going to be a scale of minus one to one, uh, whether we're holding the stick all the way down or we're holding it all the way up. Uh, and so it's going to be somewhere in that range of minus one to one. Uh, with the keyboard, it's just going to be either straight on uh, at one or straight down with minus one. So even though this is called the move up, it controls both up and down. Same thing goes for moving left and right. That's mapped to the left stick and also to DNA, left and right. And then the right stick is mapped to these things called look up and look right in the same way. And on the keyboard, those are mapped to the arrow keys. So these words here, look up, or sorry, move up, move right, look up, look right, those were character uh, programmer defined, right? These, these aren't any, there's no special meaning to these, uh, but we're going to see those in the blueprint code, and we're going to use events that they trigger to control our character. So that's, that's one thing we can look at in the project settings right here. I'm going to close that up, and I'm going to bring up our character. And so down below here, this is the contents. You've got a little file navigator here, and I'm in my blueprints area. Um, I've got two types of characters, um, the hero character and the enemy character, and they're both based on the same uh, C++ base code. So maybe before going into the character, I'll take a peek at that code. All of this could have been done just in Blueprint, but I think the, they wanted in the tutorial to sort of show how you could mix and match some C++ code with Blueprint code. So here we have um, a header file. So with C++, you have header files that sort of describe the interface of your class, and then the implementation is in the accompanying uh, CPP version of the file. If we look at the header file, I'm defining a class here called a base character. And it's inheriting from a built-in class called a character. And if we hover over that, we can see that characters are pawns that have meshes, collisions, and built-in movement logic. So there's a lot of built-in stuff with Unreal that you don't have to code yourself. And if we sort of drill down here from character, we can see that here's the base character being defined. Oh, no, that's my implementation. Here's the character. So my base character inherits from character. Character itself inherits from pawn, and a pawn is the base class of all actors that can be possessed by players and AI in the game. If we go look up the definition of a pawn, we'll see that it's coming from or inheriting from an actor, which is the base class for anything that is placeable or spawnable in a level. So like basically anything, including like the walls and the floor that's in my level uh, are considered actors. And then if we go to actor, you can see inherits from this base object just called object. So one of the things you get with Unreal is this sort of very well thought out sort of object hierarchy of things that can go into your levels and into your characters, and you can build upon those pre-created uh, pre classes. You also get a bunch of macros that allow you to map what you're doing in C++ to Blueprint. So here you can see a macro here called U-Class, and that makes this thing blueprintable. It means I'll be able to create uh, blueprint characters that have as their basis this, this character class. And then even some of the properties, like this health property or whether or not my character is dead, uh, the health property through this macro is read-writable in Blueprint. And the isDead property here is readable from within Blueprint. And then also callable from within Blueprint is this function right here called calculate health, where I can pass in a delta and it will sort of take that delta and add it, or if it's a negative number, subtract it from my health. We can look at the implementation of these things. 
So if we look in here, here is the that calculate health that takes in a delta. It adds that delta to the health and then it runs calculate dead. Calculate dead is what sets that is dead Boolean. It's going to be true if the health is less than or equal to zero. And that's really all we need to, to know about what's going on in, uh, in here. There's just a lot of it is just uh, stock stuff that was already uh, just provided to us uh, in terms of the, uh, the constructor and, uh, and whatnot. Like, but the main stuff that we implemented inside of here were just these two functions and then mapping of some things like the health and the is dead property of the blueprint. So again, there's, uh, I want you to remember two things. One, uh, which was when we were in the project settings in the input that we have this move up, move right, look up and look right. And the other is that we have these properties like is dead or calculate health that we can uh, access or call from Blueprint. So I'm gonna go into my, my hero character There's the character itself. So I can sort of zoom in, zoom out, move around in the character, even just getting used to the movements. I recommend that if you're new to Unreal, go find, sort of do a Google search for like Unreal Engine cheat sheet and find sort of a cheat sheet that explains all the, uh, the shortcuts on the keyboard and how to navigate with the mouse because without that, you can get lost very easily. Uh, you can see here that my character is built out of, um, it's got a capsule that's going to control sort of my collision box, sort of uh, where I can touch and land on the floor. Um, I can, you know, alter things around that. I can make the character, you know, the collision box smaller or wider in different degrees over here. The, there's actually a camera, like the main uh, sort of third party perspective of this game. We're looking down on the character. That's done by having this hero cam, which is attached to the player character, um, or the, it's attached to the capsule component, I guess in this case, uh, and it's called a spring arm. It's just been named a selfie stick here. And then there's also this placeholder for where the gun is going to go. If I go into the event graph, this is, this is blueprint. This is where the code happens that is sort of non C++ code. And I can navigate around in here, I'm, I'm right clicking and grabbing to move, and I'm using the scroll wheel to, to zoom in or out. You can see I've sort of commented different boxes of the code here. And here is the, the player movement. So here's that move up and move right that we defined in the settings. And the red here, these red objects, these are events. So when, either by hitting uh, you know my W, S, A, or D, on the keyboard or the left stick on the controller, I might trigger this move up or this move right. And then the way that the lines between the various boxes work is that the white lines represent the flow of code. So if you're writing code that is like text-based code, it usually flows from top to bottom. Right? There might be some loops in it, there might be some conditionals, but typically we're, we're flowing you know, line by line by line. In Blueprint, we're, we're flowing once an object gets triggered. So once one of these nodes, the red nodes, gets triggered by way of an event, the, the, we're going to flow along the white line. And in this case, we only flow to one other thing. So when we get a movement up, it's going to trigger this add movement input. That is a built-in, it's going to control uh, the pawn in question, which is this character. And it's going to take this scale value here, which is the value of this movement. And so if it is the W or the S, it's going to be either one or minus one. If it is being triggered by way of the left stick, it's going to be something in the range of minus one to one. And then that scale value is going to be applied to a change in the world direction and specifically this is going to be a change in the x direction so we're either going to move somewhere in the range of minus one to plus one um, in the x direction which is going to translate to up or down left or right is this move right here 
and that's also flowing to another add movement input. The scale value is coming through here, and in this case, we're modifying the y direction. If, we, if our character was to fly in some way, we could mess maybe with the, the z, which would take us sort of, um, you know, off or on the ground. So that's, uh, that's one thing. I'm not going to go over all of this code, but I'm going to show a little bit more here. Uh, this is the other of the sticks. This one's a little bit more complicated. This one, if we see here, there's a, there's a bit more to it. When one of these uh, sticks moves, the look up or the look right, we're only going to pay attention to the movement if it passes a certain threshold. So we actually take the two values, the, the x and y value, and we make a vector out of them. And a vector is just like a you know, mathematical construct that's two numbers, and it can be represented as a line in space. So in this case, we're going to make a vector out of those two values for sort of how much the right stick has moved, both up and down and left and right. And then we're going to create a vector on that, sort of how far away are we from the, the middle point. And if it's greater than a particular threshold, and so greater than 0.25, we're going to go to this branch statement. So you can see these events flow with white lines to this branch. So it's going to be the next thing that's evaluated. The data associated from those two things flows as well and reaches a condition. So are we, have we passed our threshold? And there's now a path of true or false. If it's true that we've passed the threshold, we want to pull the trigger on our weapon. And this weapon is actually another object within the game. Quickly, if we go over here, it is, there it is, there's the weapon. It has its own set of logic associated with it. And it has two events that are custom events, meaning that like I made these during the, uh, during the construction of this game. One is called pull trigger and the other one's called release trigger. If we go back to the character here, you can see that when we move the right stick and it passes our threshold, we're going to set the rotation of the character. So our character is going to face a new, uh, new way. We get the controller here. We set that as the target. And then we actually get that vector here, which was the combination of the X and Y. And we get the rotation from it. And we make that the new rotation of our character. I had to put a little bit of a fudge in here. In the tutorial, they had the code flowing directly from this set rotation over to pull trigger, which would pull the trigger of the gun, and that would actually do the firing, sending out projectiles. Mine, however, had a bit of a, a bug in it, and what was happening was the very first shot fired wouldn't go into the direction you were facing. It would go into the direction that you had been facing prior to touching that, that right stick. So if you had been facing uh, left before and then all of a sudden you, you face to the right, you'd fire one more to the left and then to the right. And it seemed to me like a bit of a race condition. It was like the rotation wasn't actually finished completing before the trigger was pulled. And so I fixed this with a very short delay. So it's a bit of a hack, a bit of a kludge. I have a little comment here like why, why is this even needed? Uh, but it's a very small fraction of a second. Um, and that was enough so that by the time pull trigger happened, the, the rotation uh, setting on the character was finished. And then alternatively, that's what happens when we, we pull the trigger. If we're, if we're failing this test, if we haven't passed that threshold, we follow this white line of false, we're going to release the trigger of the gun. And that's this, this second thing here. The gun is a little bit more complicated. You can see the code flows through from pull trigger. Uh, it's got to do once here, so this will not uh, allow code to flow through it anymore until it's reset. So one time, so the minute we sort of start pulling the trigger, the gun's going to fire, and then it's going to continue firing on a loop set by a timer, and then the gun's going to fire at a specific rounds per second, which is a variable that I can set here, or I could programmatically set that variable with code. And so it's going to loop and fire a function name, which is another custom event down here. And it 
goes and it finds the gun mesh, attaches a sound to it, and then I added this in. I made the sound have a slightly different volume every time between a random minimum and maximum value because the gun was sounding a little too repetitive. And so after attaching that sound, we spawn a new actor, and that actor is a projectile, which is yet another thing here. Here's my projectile. It's a stretched out sphere with a glowy material attached to it. And then it also has an event graph associated with it. Whereas it has some built-in behavior. It has protect projectile movement built into it. Um, and that's just something that Unreal um, that you can add to your different uh, pawns. And in this case, we have an event for like when this projectile overlaps with another player. So have we hit another player with our laser beam? And we only want to do anything more if that player implements a interface that we've created called I damageable. So I meaning interface and damageable meaning can take damage. And so if it's true that we've hit something that is damageable, and it's also true that it's not a friendly actor, where we've gone and like actually you can apply tags to actors. So I flagged the player character as friendly so that our, our laser beams can't hurt us. So if the thing we're hitting is damageable and it's not us, then we're going to affect health and with a certain amount of damage. This effect health goes to this I damageable interface here and it is what eventually leads us over to um, this ability to affect the player character's health by putting in a delta. It also plays a sound, the sound of the uh, enemy getting hit by a laser, the, an emitter gets spawned, and so, yeah, there's just so much to Unreal. Check this out. There is, in the provided content, particles, and we have a particular particle emitter that is the sparks, a little puff of smoke that's going to happen here in an explosion and then the sparks that fly off, and then you can like change all the different uh, you know, things that deal with the smoke and the explosion and the, and the sparks. And that's when you see the, you know, the individual bad guys get hit. This is what's, what's causing that. This is a little particle emitter. And so that's being emitted here. And then finally, destroy actor. And this doesn't mean we're destroying the actor that we're hitting, it means that we're actually uh, destroying the laser beam itself. It hits, hits something, you want to make it go away. For any of the laser beams that um, don't actually, for any of the laser beams that don't hit anything, uh, somewhere in here we gave them like a lifespan and so that they would disappear after being in the world for a certain amount of time. Um, otherwise, if we didn't do that, then um, here it is, initial lifespan. And so they would just disappear. So instead of having them like shoot out um, into space forever uh, and have the Unreal Engine have to account for all of these different projectiles, sort of as many as we had fired off into the scene, we make them disappear once they're far past our arena. Okay, I think that's uh, about as deep as I'm gonna get into looking at a lot of this code. Um, I do wanna show how things actually get to the point of, so I lied, I'm gonna show a little bit more of the code. I wanna show specifically how we're interacting with like say this is dead or this calculate health. And so I'm gonna go into the hero character and we'll look at what happens when the, when the hero takes damage. So there's a lot more to it. There's like my weapon and all this other kind of stuff, but let's just look here at take damage. Event effect health. This is part of that I damageable interface. And so like when a, going back to my blueprints, when an enemy character attacks the hero, it 
it affects the hero's health. If we go into the hero character, here's that effect health coming from that eye damageable interface. The same thing is going to be seen in the enemy when they take damage. They're going to have a take damage of their own, uh, which we were looking at a moment ago. And here's this calculate health. This is this thing here. This is what directly affects my floating point health, which is currently 100, and which can, when calling calculate death here, change the value of is dead from false to true. That's being called right here. How much is being uh, affected is this delta. That, if we look at the enemy character, is this damage value right here. So I can go into um, this variable and I can change how much that damage is. Are they going to deduct 20 points when they hit me or 100 points when they hit me or two points uh, when they hit me? And so when the enemy is damaging, they're damaging the, the hero, that's the target. This target implements the, uh, the eye damage bullet, has this effect health. And then over here, we can receive that message, take the delta in, we can call calculate health that will actually change the value of the health. It could potentially change the value of this is dead, and then we can branch on that. So again, all these white lines, that's like our code flowing. So when the event health triggers, boom, we calculate the health, we check if we're dead. If we are dead, we're going to uh, play a sound to say that we're hurt. No longer allow the character to move us around. We're gonna release the trigger of our gun. I was having some issues where the gun could potentially get stuck in a firing state when I died because we disabled input. And if we did so uh, before releasing the trigger, we could end up firing forever. And then there's a bit of a delay to play a death animation. And then we destroy that actor and we can then respawn the actor back in the scene. So that's uh, it's lots, to, lots to cover here. I, I am not gonna go into too much more uh, detail you can see that there is code behind every single one of these things, behind the projectiles, behind the weapons, um, behind the enemy characters, behind the enemy spawner, which is controlling, like dropping enemies from the sky and how many enemies are in the scene at any given time. Uh, there's the weapon itself, which is spawning the, uh, the individual projectiles, all that good stuff. Um, I will cover some of the things that I had to, to fix up. So I mentioned one of them already, which was the fact that um, that first projectile was firing in the wrong direction and I had to put a bit of a, a fix in there. Another one we just saw, which was the fact that um, I had to force the trigger to be released when the character died, otherwise it sort of got stuck on. Uh, and then the final one was yeah, the enemies were still causing damage when they were dead. And so I had to, to turn off the collision response on their capsule. Let's see where, where that was. So even when they died, they were able to continue to, to, to damage my character. And so here you can see for the capsule component and the damage volume, I am setting the collision response to ignore for both the pawns and the rest of the world. I think one of those two things was in the, uh, the tutorial, but the other one uh, wasn't, and I can't really remember uh, which of the two. The, uh, the other thing I did is when uh, I added some new things. So the characters, the enemy characters, were just disappearing after they died. Like there would be a little bit of an animation played. I wanted them to fade away. I couldn't figure out how to work with materials to have them fade away. Um, so I have them sinking through the floor. And so this is like the path of code, which is happening when the enemy dies. And what I'm doing here is uh, there's a two second delay while their death animation fires, they fall to the ground. And then I do this set event timer and I do it in a looping manner. And up here, what I'm doing is I'm getting the actor transform, which is effectively their location and scale and rotation in space. And I'm changing the Z property, which is how high off I am off the ground. And I'm changing about minus two. So they just slowly sink into the full floor when they die. The other thing I changed with enemies was, is I wanted some way to know that they were being damaged. 
So I'm actually changing uh, their color. So you can see somewhere in this chain of damage when effect health is called, after calculating the new health of the enemy, we do this change color on damage. And that is a custom thing that I produced up here. This event gets fired by being called down below. And we're going to do what's called a lerp or a in linear interpolation between the default enemy color, which is this orangey value, with this dark red. And so they're going to start this orange and they're going to get progressively more red and that's going to be controlled by their health. And this health node right here is their health property. So again, it's because it's this uh, U property blueprint read writable, that's why we're able to access it here and use it to lerp the color from one to the other. And then that's changing this body color. And then this I just barely figured out. Um, here is the mesh for the character. The mesh has a material associated with it down here. And this material was provided don't really know what's going on here, but there's one thing that I did know I could control, which is the body color. And so this body color variable, it, which controls the color of the material on this character, that's what I am lerping on over here. That's this body color here. So I'm setting this vector parameter, I'm setting it on the dynamic material that I'm pulling in here, and I'm lerping based on the health between the initial enemy color and this final darker red enemy color. So this wasn't meant to be like a, a clear tutorial on how to actually do this coding. If you're more interested in how all this works, I'd, I'd highly recommend you work through those two tutorials that I mentioned uh, at the start, which is the, uh, the official Your First Hour with Unreal Engine and then the, the Twin Stick Shooter. Uh, with Blueprint. Uh, they're both really great. They'll walk you through the whole process. Uh, they come with a bunch of assets. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I'm going to post a link to this page that just sort of shows what I've been working on. I've also been compiling a list of game development links, uh, and these are anything from blog posts to ebooks, um, collections of cheat sheets and whatnot. So I mentioned earlier on that it would be good to have an Unreal Engine cheat sheet. Well, there's one in this list here, so I'll put this link in the, the description video as well. Uh, the only other thing I would say is that I've been uh, also working with Git uh, as version control for this twin stick shooter. And I was initially a little bit worried that I wouldn't, here, let me just, why is that not there, that I wouldn't be able to use Git or GitHub specifically because there would be uh, there's a maximum size to repositories you can put up on GitHub, and the assets in Unreal Engine can be really, really big. Uh, here's where source control is defined. You can see I've got it set up to use Git for source control. Uh, when you set this up, Unreal drops a git ignore file into your folder to specify like the various files and folders that you, you don't need to be part of your repository. Um, the thing I needed to set up to work with GitHub was something called the large file storage extension. So if we go over here, get large file storage, it's a way of working with really large files like uh, assets in video games. Uh, and it works well with GitHub, whereas normally GitHub will have a maximum size of your repo. When you're using this, this large file storage extension, it allows you to get around that. And I'm, I'm not sure of the details of uh, how exactly it's doing this. Uh, I'm not even sure if it was built into the version of Git I had. I did download and install this uh, package here on the Git LFS website. Uh, I'm not sure if that was totally required from the command line. I also ran like a Git LFS install in my project repo, and I'm not sure if that was totally required either. Uh, but this file here, this Git attributes, is basically saying everything in the content folder, which is where all the assets are. Uh, that is um, going to be handled by the long-term file storage. And this worked just great. Once I set that up, I was able to um, 
add the entire project to a Git repository and push the whole thing up to GitHub, including all that content. And so it just worked really, really nicely. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the tour. I basically just did this mainly for myself, just to capture some of the, the learning, some of the things that um, I ran into in terms of problems with this tutorial. There wasn't many, but I, was, I managed to, to sort of get around them as I came up with them. Some of the additions that I added, Oh yeah, one more thing here, check this out. Uh, you might not be able to hear the sounds again because they're just on my computer speaker, but I did add this ability for when a character got hurt, it would play a hurt sound. So you can see this play hurt sound here, that's going to a custom event, which eventually goes to this, uh, what's called a queue. So here's the speaker, which is the output. And then I went on the internet, I got four different sounds of grunting. And again here, I don't know if you'll be able to hear these. Uh, but if I click this node here, each one of these gets piped through this random node. So every time we play this cue, it's going to pick one of these four sounds to play just for a little bit of variety so that when I'm being injured, I'm going to get one of these sounds. That looks a little less random than I was expecting it to be. That looked not really random. Oh, there, a little bit of randomness there. Um, okay, um, yeah, that's that's what I wanted to show off. Um, I felt really daunted by Unreal at the beginning just because there was so much to it, and there still is. There's a whole bunch of it that I don't fully understand yet, and I'm not going to try to learn it all. I'm going to try to focus mostly on the coding aspects, but you can't really help sort of learning some of the uh, the stuff that sits around that. A bunch more tutorials that I want to do. Most of them are just YouTube tutorials, so I'll check back as I implement some more of those, and I'll also make um, a few videos, maybe showing some of the procedural graphic generation stuff I'm doing with Houdini. Anyways, uh, leave some comments if you're also working on game development, or if you have any questions about what I've been doing here, or any questions about this tutorial specifically. Uh, thanks for watching. Talk to you next time. Bye bye.